Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Good morning, Jesus 911 on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. We are a two man car. My partner, Jesse Romero, myself, Ruben Nava. We are 10 8 and going to give you some Catholic uh, intel, some Catholic briefing. Good morning, Jesse. Reporting for duty, sir. Good morning, Ruben. Good morning. Uh, yeah, we're going to give you some SWAT training, spiritual weapons, and tactics. Ready to go. Yes, Jess, we're going to start uh, start off the show by uh, praying the prayer that was written by uh, Archbishop Maria uh, Carlo Maria Vigano, and it's for uh, the United States of America and for our leaders. Um, yep. So we're, um, until the election, we think we, we, this is a beautiful prayer, and we're going to. Uh, I would like everybody to print it up and and say it as well with us every morning. So it goes as uh, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. Almighty and eternal God, King of kings and Lord of lords, graciously turn your gaze to us who invoke you with confidence. Bless us, citizens of the United States of America. Grant peace and prosperity to our nation. Illuminate those who govern us so that they may commit themselves to the common good in respect for your holy law. Protect those who, defending the inviolable principles of the natural law and your commandments, must face the repeated assaults of the enemy of the human race. Keep in the hearts of your children courage for the truth love for virtue, and perseverance in the midst of trials. Make our families grow in the example that our Lord has given us, together with His Most Holy Mother and St. Joseph in the home of Nazareth. Give to our fathers and mothers the gift of strength to educate wisely the children with which you have blessed them. Give courage to those who, in spiritual combat, fight the good fight as soldiers of Christ against the furious forces of the children of darkness. Keep each one of us, O Lord, in your most sacred heart, and above all, he whom your providence has placed at the head of our nation. Bless the President of the United States of America so that aware of his responsibility and his duties, he may be the knight of justice, a defender of the oppressed, a firm bulwark against your enemies, and a proud supporter of the children of light. Place the United States of America and the whole world under the mantle of the Queen of Victories, our unconquered leader in battle, the Immaculate Conception. It is thanks to her and through your mercy that the hymn of praise rises to you, O Lord, from the children whom you have redeemed in the most precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In nome Patri, Fili, et Spiritu Sancti. Amen. Amen. And just a beautiful as we, prayer. It wow. is. It is. And and while we're doing and while we're today's show's going on, I, I'm I'm really uh I was made known it was made known to me that uh the Board of Supervisors, LA County Board of Supervisors is um Sheila Kuhl and Hilda Solis, they're authoring an agenda to lay off LA County Sheriff's deputies. And um, um, this measure will defund all unincorporated sheriff stations forever. And uh, so there's a board meeting today at at 9.30 Tuesday today. Here's the phone number if you want to call in, 844-761-5651, 844-761-5651. And the participant code is 967-6436. You can express your outrage. Ruben, I'm thinking that... uh... Uh, Sheriff Villa, Villanueva is probably not too happy that he won the sheriff's office. He's probably saying, you know, why don't I go out and retire instead of uh, become the sheriff of L.A. County? Because now he's got it's funny because, you know, uh, in his website, he uh, has a lot of Democrat support and he had a lot of uh, Democrat endorsements. But right now he's basically seeing that the party that he's part of is anti-law enforcement and defund the police. So I think I think he's having heartburn right now about probably his political positions. I'm just guessing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, like it says in Proverbs 29:2, when the the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. That's exactly <laughs> what's happening right now across America. Yep. Ruben, and here's something interesting talking about law enforcement, the police union the National Police Officers Union, the president, Michael McHale, in a letter that he wrote to the Washington Times, they've dropped Biden uh, for President Trump because they're seeing all this anti-police activism by the left. And basically, it's it's uh, the military arm of the Democrat Party. And so this is kind of a a strange move because unions, police unions, all unions typically go for the Democratic uh, person who's running for office. 
But in this case, the article says, in a rare, in a rare not, because it, it is rare that a union does this. From a union, President Donald Trump has earned the endorsement from the National Association of Police Organizations because of his steadfast and very public support for law enforcement. Again, National Association of Police Organizations, Michael McHale, in a letter that he wrote to the president, he said, we particularly value you, Mr. President, directing the attorney general to aggressively prosecute those who attack our officers. And uh, this organization represents more than a a thousand police unions, 241,000 sworn officers. And uh, again, this uh, the whole defund the police movement. It just might cost Biden endorsements from other unions as well. According to Paul Di 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 Giacomo, who's uh, who's also part of the Detectives Endowment Association, he says right now, I can't see any police or law enforcement group backing him, Biden, after what he said, dancing around the subject of policing in America. Again, this is from the Detectives Endowment Association president, Paul D. Giacomo. Ruben? That's right. Um, they, they supported uh, Obama and Biden in, 20, uh, in 2008 and 2012. And the last election, 2016, they refused to endorse either Trump or Democratic opponent Hillary Clinton. So they stayed neutral. I think, you know, like you said, the police units have typically um, supported the Democrats. But there's been a domino effect, uh, probably goes all the way back to the, the early 90s. Maybe 94 or so that they started leaning more conservatively and um, it's it's showing its face right now with this all the defund the, the police and uh, Jesse it's I, I haven't um, I knew that uh, our governor here was was trying to release 8,000 people I, I heard just recently that it's the number has has swooned to 18,000 people from prison Um I, I have no idea what these politicians think um, their job is, but the, the number one job is to keep people safe, you know, Correct. and, and um, you, you can't pursue your, your freedom, your constitutional rights without, without being free and feeling safe in your, in your home and in your neighborhoods and you're, you're going to your businesses. And um, it's so like we start off with that prayer. It's, it's, encompasses all our leaders and and uh over here we have probably the worst governor in uh well it's between us and uh, new york <laughs> yeah it's a toss-up <laughs> yeah yeah so uh well let, let me just give you just some words of encouragement because yeah it's it's a it's a hard pill to swallow you just said saint paul says in romans eight thirty seven, he says no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him, Jesus, who loved us. So just we just got to hang on to those promises. We're conquerors in Christ. Doesn't mean that there's not going to be any casualties. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be a time of suffering. We have entered, Reuben, just let's just be honest. It's been already, hap- it's happened for a while, but we've already entered into the passion of Christ as a church. And once we realize that, it's going to be easier to swallow what's going on right now. And just at this moment, it's just a matter of uh, accepting that cross and offering our sufferings and our prayers and voting properly and opening our mouths and sharing, speaking the truth with other people when it comes to religion and politics, which are the two topics that nobody wants to talk about. Right. And but, uh, you know, on Tuesday, uh, Biden, he focused on, on his first public speech in months. He focused on race, you know, highlighted the rights of the protesters and offered up police reforms. He made only a, a passing um, mention of the police officers. The, the Trump campaign criticized him for failing to mention police killed and wounded amidst the unrest. And so, like Trump said, Biden hasn't said a single word on, on the one of the most horrific aspects of the bloodshed. Attacks by rioters and looters, sometimes fatal on police officers in the line of duty. So protecting uh, innocent Americans... And, and uh, Trump campaign said on Wednesday that that uh, that highlighted police deaths and injuries in eight instances nationwide. And, you know, uh, another thing that's troubling is when we, we see what uh, the left is promoting, promoting anarchy, they're promoting and they're, uh, you know, defunding the police. But, um, you know, uh, well, maybe we can talk about this on Thursday, what the uh, our, our, the USCCB is doing. 
is there uh, some of the organizations they're sponsoring are directly going to defund the police and yeah let's Black talk Lives about Matter. that for sure right I, I sent you a couple articles for that on thursday yep. and so hopefully um we yeah ruben that's that's an infiltration into our church let's just be honest marxism communist marxism has infiltrated our church our beloved church not everybody obviously you know uh but it's made enough of, a, of an effect for again s- a certain agencies within the church and people and bishops and priests are compromised they're compromised. They're they're in bed with the enemy. Right. And of course, one party, the Democrats, have been basically totally compromised by the left. Uh, you got schools, you, universities, the med, the medical profession. Something that we thought that was hands off. Okay, medicine is is unbiased. It's objective. No, Ruben. Oh yeah. N- now we have the medical profession that's been hijacked and politicized by the Marxist left. Anything the Marxist left touches, schools, universities, politics, medicine, uh, anything they touch. Judges, they destroy. Yeah. Well, Big Pharma is part of that uh, globalism. Yeah, Big yeah. Pharma. And yep. um, so, you know, I think I like the, what Proverbs twenty one fifteen says. It is joy to the just to do judgment, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. And that's what we have in, in, in uh, politics. Oh, we're going to be switching gears and uh, in the next segment. Don't change that dial. Oh, yeah. And black slavery exists in Muslim nations. Did you know that? This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, a portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year round. May God bless you and your family. baby move in your tummy? How does the baby eat? Can the baby hear me? How did the baby get in there? Wow, a pregnancy can sure generate a lot of questions, but what's important is that a baby is a baby inside and out of the womb, not just after birth, but nine months before at conception. That's right, every baby is a miracle. Hello, my name is Marianne Koharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance, or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org, or better yet, simply dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say the key word pro-life. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. A baby's heart is beating 18 days from conception. Pro-life across America, the people. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, we are back. We are going to switch gears and talk about black slavery, slavery which exists in today in Muslim nations. It, it's a, a it's a dirty topic. little secret, Ruben, that nobody wants to talk about, especially the mainstream media or colleges or public education. That Muslims today, what they own black slaves, unbelievable. Nobody's talking about it. Nope. Here's a great uh, articles by Pamela Jeller, and she's all over this. It's called "Black Slavery Exists Today." In Muslim nations, 
She says, for years, a handful of my colleagues and I have worked to increase awareness of black slavery in Muslim countries. The Democrat media complex couldn't care less. Mm. Neither do the notoriously hard left black leaders that I call race baiters. I'm saying that. Uh, she, she mentions the hard left black leaders such as Sharpton, Farrakhan, I'll add Jesse Jackson. They know about this. They can care less. Black slavery exists today and it's rampant in these Muslim-dominated African countries, but nobody's talking about it. Today, an estimated, get this, 529,000 to 869,000 black men, women, and children are still slaves wow. right now. They are bought, owned, sold, and traded by Arab and Muslim masters in five African countries. These statistics, estimates... Those enslaved in Algeria, Libya, Mauritania, and Sudan. It excludes Nigeria, for which there are no tangible estimates. When, and Western human rights organizations and the mainstream media are practically and painfully silent on this matter. Why? Because it does not fit with their focus on Western white men. It doesn't fit the narrative that white men are bad people and the, the, the white police is a big bad boogeyman. So here's a brief survey of this quasi-taboo topic. We'll go through four or five countries. Ruben, you want to start with Sudan? The Sudan, yeah. In Sudan, slavery remains it's a, a painful vestige of the Second Sudanese Civil War. It was from 18, or 1983 to 2005. That's when the uh, Arab Muslims gov government in the north of the country declared a jihad upon the black, largely Christian south. They killed perhaps 2.5 million people and enslaved as many as... 200,000. Jesse, that's how the, we could say today that there's more martyrs today than there were in all of the centuries put together. Amen. Slaves rescued Spot by grass. On. Yeah, slave, slaves rescued by grassroots ab abolitionists tell horrific stories, abduction, beatings, forced conversions to Islam, gr grueling labor, female genital mutilation, malnutrition, rape. The taking of Christian slaves has become a source of compensation for Islamic fighters. Um, so... They, these slaves, they have told horrific stories. The war ended in 2005. Black and, and both uh, Black and South Sudan became the world's newest nation on July 9th, 2011. Still, many black slaves remain the property of Arab masters across the new border in the north. The exact number is not known. As of 2006, James Aguir Alik, a former Sudanese government minister, estimated that it could be as high as 35,000. So why aren't Jesse? Why aren't they uh, boycotting? Uh, boycotting because they're not white policemen, mm, or they're not white Americans. Right That's on. why. Right on. Maritania. Let's look at Exhibit B or, or ne next country sample B. In Maritania, the very structure of society reinforces slavery. Over the centuries, a cruel class system has evolved. The lighter-skinned Arabs rule over the black former slaves. Mm. Those slaves have been forcibly Arabized over time and the free blacks in the south who refuse Arabization and call themselves Negro Africans and the black chattel slave class they're at the bottom bottom of the food chain the country Mauritania is entirely Muslim Islam theoretically forbids the enslavement of one Muslim by another in theory however in this case Arab racism supersedes adherence to the Sharia Islamic law in 1993, a U.S. State Department report estimated that between, get this, 30,000 and 90,000 blacks lived as slaves owned by private masters. And in 2012, you know, CNN, sometimes they get things right. You know, even a, even a broken clock is uh, correct twice a day. That's right. A CNN investigation estimated that the number could be as high as 340,000 wow. to 680,000 black slaves. No slave market exists in Maritania. All slaves are born in master's households. Pregnancy occurs from the master's insemination of black slave women or through mandated breeding of slave couples. And in the absence of open markets, slaves change hands quietly in individual sales. They're also traded as substitutes for money in the setting of gambling debts Slaves can, black slaves, let's say, can even be rented. 
Mm. Unbelievable, Ruben. Wow. And in Algeria and Libya, sub-Saharan, sub-Saharan uh, Africans fleeing violence and poverty for, for Europe are enslaved by Algerian and Libyan Arabs as uh, they try to cross the Mediterranean. Today, according to the Global Slavery Index, about 106,000 black Africans are estimated to be enslaved in Algeria. Migrant women, but also children, both male and female, risk being forced into sexual slavery. Men perform unskilled labor. Those who avoid slavery are also subjected to virulent uh, Arab racism. This was recently confirmed by a recent New York Times report. This further marginalizes the already destitute. So this is not some um, right-wing conspiracy theory. This, this New York Times is by no means uh, <laughs> conservative. Or CNN, Ruben. Yeah. yeah. So Africans hoping for a better life in Europe also traveled to Libya to be trafficked across the Mediterranean, often to Italy. Once there, some are enslaved by local Arabs and traffickers. As of 2016, according to the UN, there are between 700,000 and 1 million black African migrants in Libya. The Global Slavery Index estimates many as uh, 48,000 of them live as slaves of some nature. Survivors report torture, sex trafficking, and slavery. Some even forced to become prostitutes only after they, they've reached their destination. So the slave trade in Libya became international news when CNN obtained video of an actual slave auction in 2016. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Let's look at uh, the example for Nigeria. In Nigeria, the long-running civil war between the Muslim majority and the 40% Christian minority involves the enslavement of Christian Nigerians. Surprise, surprise. The taking of Christian slaves has become a source of compensation for Islamic fighters. In other words, they call that the booty, taking the booty in war, uh, the spoils of war. The recent rise of jihad organizations like ISIS affiliate Boko Haram has been the main source of contemporary slave trades. And the most famous incident of a slave raid was Boko Haram's abduction of 276 Christian schoolgirls it happened in the town of Chibok on April 14, 2014. It inspired, it even inspired Michelle Obama, uh, the first lady, uh, a couple years ago. She put a hashtag, bring back our girls, hashtag. Most slaves are young girls, kidnapped and kept as the concubines of the Islamic soldiers. In other words, it's their, it's their personal, it's their personal uh, brothel is what it is. Because they force them in prostitution, they force them. Some of those prefer to become some of these women instead of being, you know, into forced prostitution to terrorists. They prefer to become suicide bombers to escape the life of a sex slave. And though the U.S. Department's uh, the U.S. State Department's 2018 Human Rights Report on Nigeria mentions that the number of slaves captured and owned by Boko Haram terrorists today could be in the thousands. The full number is, as of now, unknown. All this uh, investigative reporting uh, was done by Charles Jacobs. He's a president of the American Anti-Slavery Group, and his work can be seen. His website is uh, iabolish.org. That's I as in Ida, and then the word abolish.org. Ruben? Yeah, Jesse, um, there's a, a, an article that I, I, I may have referenced on another show, but... Uh, when the slave traders were African, those were uh, those whose ancestors sold slaves to Europeans now struggle to come to terms with painful a legacy, and that was written uh, last year in September. And you know, there's it's something they really don't want to talk about. But uh, these are um, people who are educated people that are writing this this document. There was a guy by the name of uh, Donald Duke. He's a, he was a lawyer. He ran for president of Nigeria. And uh, he was elected governor of Cross River State in 1999. And his administration, they built uh, the Slave History Museum near the point on the coast from which slaves were shipped. And one of his exhibitions depicts various currencies of slave trade, such as flutes, as Dane guns, and brass belts. So they was trading for these slaves. So it's not a glorious past, he says, but it is the truth, Mr. Duke said. That's why I went out to document it. Uh, it, it and, and nobody wants to talk about this stuff. It's a uh, it's a really uh, pretty d- deep article about uh, what was going on uh, like 400 years ago, but this is still going on today in in Africa, and then uh, you know, 
that they didn't get to the to the United States by themselves, Jesse. You know, no. they were sold by other Africans. Yeah, blacks sold blacks to uh, to the whites uh, uh, to the white uh, slave owners that went over there to buy them. They were already enslaved by blacks. In fact, uh, I got a book here. It's called by Dinesh D'Souza. It's called America: Imagine a World Without Her. Uh, on the next mm-hmm. segment, I'm, I'm going to share some stuff where he does the research on this and he, and he gets into some specificity. And also, uh, we have another article, Ruben. It's a, it, it turned out to be a book, and the book is called Barracoon, The Story of the Last Black Cargo. So it's uh, we'll give a summary of the story of an Atlantic slave trade between Africa and the U.S. And it's a, it's a nonfiction biography of Curio Lewis, who, who was the last survivor of the Atlantic slave trade. And, uh, yeah, Ruben, this... And I'll be honest with you, just uh, truth be told, I don't know why statues or any vestiges of, of, of Muhammad, his name, they should be torn down. Oh, Muhammad yeah. owned slaves. Jesus Christ freed slaves. Big difference. I'm going to say it again. Our Lord Jesus Christ freed slaves specifically from their sin. That's why he came to to to. to pay the price for our sins because we were enslaved to eternal damnation. And Jesus Christ obviously uh, never owned any slaves and taught people the golden rule, treat people as you want to treat uh, as you want to be treated. Not Muhammad, not not on his watch. The man owned brothels and the man owned slaves. And it's funny the way uh, Black Lives Matter and Antifa seems to be, you know, they're, they're not demanding any any uh, I don't know, vestiges of murals or paintings or pictures of muhammad to be torn down i'm just kind of curious interesting <laughs> that's true jess uh there's there's a lot of history right here that we're we're talking about and it's 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 true it's documented but they just want to rewrite their own their own history they want to uh get rid of all of uh, western civilization and just rewrite it their own uh their own way so all right that's we're right gonna be talking about these barracoon what was that all about what was that story about so Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is not fun. Hi, this is Jesse Romero from the Terry and Jesse Show, also from Jesus 911. Let's face it, we all need to use the internet, but we need screen accountability. Why? Pornography is a huge problem, especially on the internet. And every time we tap into the internet, we get bombarded with images and temptations that degrade our humanity. So we need Covenant Eye to block these pornographic sites and advertisements from infiltrating our lives. Covenant Eyes helps us take custody of our eyes and custody of our intellect. So I recommend you go to CovenantEyes.com and type in the promo code BMPR to support the network. Protect yourself and your family from the eminent threats on the internet. www.CovenantEyes.com code VMPR live porn free. Thank you for listening to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Thank you. God bless you. Keep the faith. Healthcare news today seems to be coming from everywhere and everyone. It's confusing, at least, and untrustworthy at the worst. Dr. Asetta is a faithful Catholic in the Kern County community. He is trustworthy, well-researched, and will only give expert opinion on matters in his own specialty. Catholic teaching at its entirety is of utmost importance to Dr. Asetta. Give Dr. Asetta a call for your obstetrics and gynecological needs at 661-695-6617. 
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888 526 2151. Jesus 911, we are back. I'm going to give a plug for uh, a prayer vigil that we're, we're doing this Sunday. We were out there last Sunday. This is, uh, we, I spoke about it last Thursday. It was uh, it's put on by, um, by Laura. Um, Chavez, she, she's got a, a group of prayer warriors out there in front of the uh, uh, L.A. Cathedral, and they're on the sidewalk. Uh, two hours of prayer. We do a full uh, 15 decades of the rosary. We had about 100 people out there this past Sunday. Uh, we want to get the bishop's attention to open the churches fully, full sacraments, full attendance, fullness of faith. You know, why can't uh, why if we can go to Walmart and Costco, uh, why can't we have mass? And that's uh, it's a violation of our constitutional rights and uh, canon law. And uh, let's have you out there joining us. You can park right on. Um, I believe it's Temple. Yeah, right on Temple. Uh, they're not. There's no uh, parking uh, meters there, and uh, it. And also, there's parking on Hill Street. So come join us. I'll be out there again, and uh, let's try to get the the numbers to swoon to double what we had on Sunday. We got to get these uh, to get this bishop's attention and. Um, and then what we're going to talk about on on Thursday, perhaps Jesse, that that's it's very uh, disheartening. Yeah, yeah, so, it's okay. And but uh, yeah, Ruben, we have to do our part, and uh, I'll, I'll promote this uh, every single day that I'm on. Okay, uh, good. The fact that which Lord Chavez and, and 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 you, what you guys are doing out there, this is important. We got a public praying of the Rosary is very important. Our Lady of Fatima says. This is much more powerful, public prayer of the rosary than private prayer of the rosary. Our Lady of Fatima said that. There's more graces that are unleashed. So. Pope Pius IX said, give me an army saying the rosary, and I will conquer the world. And I so. believe that, because t- history has proven that to be true over and over again. That's right. Ruben, there's a book. It's called Barracoon, the Story of the Last Black Cargos. It, there's a summary by Zora Hurston, the author. And what it is... It's a uh, it's again, it's a summary of the story of a of a slave, the true story of a, of a black slave. It's it's nonfiction biography of a slave called Curio Lewis, who back in 1927 was the last surviving the, the last surviving uh, or the last survivor, should I say, of the Atlantic slave trade between Africa and the U.S. And based on interviews with the author Lewis uh, that she conducted with uh, Zora Neale Hurston. The book was published back in 2018, nearly 60 years after Hurston's death. Uh, and the book is told primarily in Lewis's own dialect. Lewis, Cudio Lewis, he was a slave, which Hurston preserves as best as she can. In fact, the preservation of Lewis's dialect and vernacular is a, is publisher's most commonly cited reason for, uh, for, for failing to publish the book in Hurston's lifetime. Right, and so the word a barracoon is defined as an enclosure in which black slaves were confined for a limited period. So this is obviously a reference to the long boat ride from Africa over here across the Atlantic over here. Ruben, want to continue? Yeah. So he was born around 1840, what's now known as the West African country of Benin. Lewis is given name Oloale Kosula. Lewis was one of 13 children born to his father's three wives. At the age of 19, Lewis was about to be married and to embark on his people's rituals of manhood. However, members of of the nearby kingdom of Dahomey invaded his camp and slaughtered his family. After being taken prisoner by the Dahomey people, Lewis was brought to the coast where he, he was sold to, to sl- slave ship Captain William Foster. Ruben, let me make one comment right that we just read. This is important. It just Because this is a constant history. You find one African tribe conquering another African tribe through war, and then they would sell the prisoners that they enslaved to white men. That's right. This is the, this is what the, the true narrative that happened 
uh, for we, what we call the Atlantic slave trade. And that was hap- that's happening in the Middle East with what was ISIS was doing to some of those Christian uh, cities, taking them as slaves and taking them as sex uh, sex. Yeah, objects. they're doing it right now still, as we just said in the last segment. Yeah. <laughs> so Lewis was brought to Alabama along with uh, other slaves, even though the importation of slaves from Africa was prohibited in 1808. Nevertheless, many continue to flout the law. In fact, uh, some reports suggest that Timothy Meher, Meher, uh, the owner of the slave ship, captain by Foster, bet a colleague $100,000 that he could continue to import slaves with impunity. Uh, Meher and Foster were caught by authorities. However, they successfully hid Lewis and the other slaves for almost five months. And in the absence of physical evidence of the slaves' existence, the case against Meher and Foster were dismissed. And as the color purple author Alice Walker notes in her introduction to the book, Lewis's narrative is not the is not the one many modern readers readers will expect. For example, Lewis spends as much time bemoaning the attitudes of fellow black slaves toward him as he does his masters who enslaved him. American uh, born slaves, he says, mocked new arrivals from Africa like Lewis, referring to him and the others as savages. Meanwhile, Lewis makes the uncomfortable admission that one of his masters was a good man simply because he fed his slaves enough and, they, and had their shoes fixed. This is, uh, this, make no mistake, a harrowing read, Walker writes in her introduction, adding, we are being shown the wound. Here, something about that paragraph that jumps out at me. So this, uh, this slave, Lewis, that they're writing about, he said something nice about uh, the slave masters. Right. I mean, right now, they would, uh, if you would do something, they would, they would cancel him right now, Ruben. He, the cancel culture would say, oh. you can't be saying something. You're black. Yeah. You can't be saying something nice about white people. He would be canceled uh, if, if he was Tom. on Facebook or social media or, uh, yeah. In other words, political correctness would, would just shut him down. Yeah. The second thing that you read that, that jumps out at me is that, it says uh, Lewis spends as much time bemoaning, that means complaining, the attitudes of fellow black slaves towards him as he does his masters who enslaved him. In other words, so he, yeah, there's nothing popular about saying, hey, I'm being picked on by other blacks. There's nothing popular about saying 6,000 blacks killed 6,000 blacks a year in the inner cities of this country. There's nothing popular. But if one white police officer, okay, accidentally by excessive use of force or something, kills a black suspect, this is going to be spoken of day in and day out. But 6,000 blacks killing 6,000 blacks, you hear crickets. Nobody wants to talk about it. And that's exactly what it says in that article. You know, Lewis talks about this, about black slaves, uh, how, how, the, the, how mean they are. Uh, uh, and and, he, and uh, the fact that he, uh, those that enslaved him. And he also talks about what you read, American-born slaves, he says, mock new arrivals from Africa. Ruben, I've seen that all my life. A lot of my black American friends, they, uh, they speak very contemptuously about Africans. And I've always scratched my head when I, see, when I hear that. And I say, why do you, I, I'm, I don't understand. I mean, why, why did you say that? Oh, man, he's from Africa. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, I'm from America. Are you kidding me? He's from, and there's this contempt, Ruben, for black people, that were that were born and uh, raised in Africa when they come over here to the US yeah they're not from in- black americans not all of them obviously like paul clay wouldn't be one of those but secular black americans they have contempt for uh, black africans and they and and by the way the same thing spills into the mexican culture oh. i don't know how many times i've been called names sometimes under their breath by mexicans from mexico mm-hmm. because they look at me like a fake mexican right. okay they call me Pocho. They call me. I mean, there's all kinds of names that they call you, and I just laugh it off. But, but uh, yeah, this is just this is just a factual statement. There is prejudice even amongst Mexicans to Mexicans and blacks to blacks. Absolutely, that's and and I think when he was saying he was bemoaning the other some of these other ones, other slaves there that it could be you know that he was working hard. He was doing his what uh, he was considered a good slave. He was working and and. There's always going to be those that are um, don't have the work ethic as of others, and and so he's he was probably doing twice the work of some of them. And you know how we we saw that in as county workers, man. <laughs> that's a county worker right there for you, Jesse. 
It, it, That's right. Just doing the the minimum they can get away with. Go ahead, Jess. Okay. So perhaps it is Lewis's lack of resentment or rage that makes the losses he details all the more powerful. In addition to losing his family, home, and traditions in Africa, I mean, this guy lost everything. Lewis lost his wife and three of his children. This is the modern day Job. Jonah. Job, yeah. Job. His wife and one child died of sickness. However, one child was murdered by a deputy sheriff and the other was killed by a train. Lewis, the slave uh, that is now in America, talks about wanting to return to Africa. After the end of the Civil War, he and other slaves who were brought over by Timothy Meher, the owner of the slave ship, uh, the possibility of raising money to return to West Africa. The men worked long hours, mostly at lumber mills, while the women fra- farmed and sold their own produce. However, after a few months of this backbreaking work, Lewis, the slave, and the others realized that they would likely never raise enough money to go home. Instead, they used the money to buy land around Magazine Point, Alabama, near where they had worked for Timothy Meher, again, the owner of the blacks of the slave ship. There they established a self-sufficient community called Africa Town, which they felt was a refuge, not just from the predations of racist white Americans, but also native-born black Americans whom they felt didn't understand their customs. Again, that's the same point that I just made. They, they also felt prejudice from their own people that were born here. Many of the Africa town residents spoke in their native African languages and followed the religions of their communities back in Africa. Lewis, however, converted to Christianity in 1869. Around that time, he became a naturalized American citizen. Here's two points I want to make, Ruben. The first fact is this. As I said it again, I'll say it uh, before I'll say it again. Africans enslaved other Africans through war and conquest and sold them to white men like Timothy Meher and others. Okay, That's the first That's a fact of history. Yeah. Second fact, black slaves born in America held black slaves from Africa, born in Africa, in contempt. Right. That still exists today. I've seen this prejudice all my life. You know, uh, Jesse, um, when... Oh, the, when Hurston tried to get this uh, this Barracoon published in 1931, she couldn't find a taker. And uh, there was concern among black intellectuals and political leaders that the book laid bare, uncomfortably bare, Africans' involvement in the slave trade. <laughs> so, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get more into this, talk about what the Catholic Church says about slavery. Oh, yeah. All right. We'll be right back. Help the Helpless, a Minnesota St. Paul nonprofit organization chaired by Father of Tear and volunteers, is humbly asking you for your kind support to help the poor and the handicapped children in India and Ecuador. Through financial support from the help of the helpless benefactors, the children are provided with clothing, food, education, shelter, and the teachings of the Catholic Church. The mission is to help children thrive and become self-sufficient young adults leading productive lives. We also provide aid to poor families in Ecuador with food baskets, medicines, medical assistance, and help with funeral needs for the deceased. The work in India is done by Father Antonio's organization, St. Mary's. In Ecuador, the work is being done by the Servant Sisters of the Home of Mother. You can call us at 877-762-8857. To learn more, please visit our website, www.helpthehelpless.org. God bless you. In Luke 7, Jesus said, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven her, because she has been shown great love. According to St. John of the Cross, Christians should always remember that the value of their good works is not based on number and excellence. Their value is based on the love for God that prompts them to do the works. May we always be motivated by true love for God and not worry so much about what we do, but why we do it. 
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, where iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. We're bringing you some some information that uh, you don't hear, <laughs> uh, you're not hearing on CNN and, and, and MSNBC. There are black slaves um, today, you know, in the Muslim nations in the, in Africa, and 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 how the slaves were brought here, other slaves that sold them to the white man. Ruben, let me just mention some stuff here from a it's a it's a book by Dinesh D'Souza. He was a right. Stanford scholar. He wrote, he was a speechwriter for President Reagan. Uh, he's a New York Times bestseller. His book's called America. Look what he says about slavery. It's real short, but it's it's worth reading. He says. From the, from the dawn of mankind, every culture has had slavery. There was slavery in ancient Greece and Rome and China and Africa and in India. American Indians had slaves long before Columbus arrived. What is uniquely Western is not slavery, but the abolition of slavery. No civilization once dependent on slavery has ever been able to eradicate it according to Dr. Roberts, who's a historian, except the West. I'm referring, to the, I'm referring to free blacks who themselves owned black slaves. While the existence of black slave ownership is known, its magnitude is surprising. A review of the relevant scholarship shows that in 1830, there were 3,500 American black slave owners who collectively owned more than 10,000 African slaves. Is this a microphone on? Exactly. <laughs> Let me read that sentence. This is from Dr. J.M. Roberts, who's a Western historian. He, say, he says, uh, a review of the relevant scholarship shows that in 1830, there were 3,500 American black slave owners who collectively own more than 10,000 African slaves. In a book, The Black Masters, Michael Johnson and James Rohr tell a more remarkable story of William Ellison, a free black planter and cotton gin maker in South Carolina who owned more than 100 slaves. He himself descended from slaves. Ellison, who was black, did not hesitate to buy slaves and work them in the same manner as white slave owners. Johnson and Rourke, these authors in the book Black Masters, uh, they write, Allison, who was black, did not view his shop and plantation as halfway houses to freedom for blacks. He never permitted a single slave to duplicate his own experience. Everything suggests that Allison, this black master, slave owner, held his slaves to exploit them, to profit from them, just as white slave owners did. And when the Civil War broke out, most black slave owners like Allison, who's black, joined their white counterparts in supporting the Confederacy. One more line. There is no history of an anti-slavery movement outside the West. Even atheists, even the atheists admit that the anti-slavery movements in Europe and America were led by Christianity. And this idea is beautifully expressed in Lincoln's maxim. Pre, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln said, quote, As I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. Close quote. Lincoln understood this to be nothing more than an application of Christ's golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So why is slavery wrong? Slavery is wrong because the slave has not consented to the terms of employment. And guess what? It took a civil war to destroy slavery and some 6 
100,000 white men were killed in that war. One life of a white man for every six slaves that were freed. If we're doing our history, let's remember that white soldiers who died in order to achieve freedom for the slaves, they owed the slaves nothing. The slaves owed them their freedom, a freedom that the slaves were not in a position to secure for themselves. And uh, here's the last point. The idea of colonization disappeared after the Civil War because black leaders like Fre Frederick Douglass realized that their, pre that their premises were wrong. America was founded by white men, but it, it was not founded as a white man's country. America was founded on the principle of equality, not just equal dignity, but also the equal right of people to govern themselves and advance themselves and freely sell their labor. It took a bitter war to reconcile those principles and extend the Pledge of Equality to the, to the enslaved African American, but hundreds of thousands of white men fought that war and paid in their own blood for their country's sin of slavery. Mm. Man, that's some good stuff that Dinesh just put out, Ruben. He's good. Wow. That's right. But uh, <laughs> the last administration... But don't, don't, yeah, don't be confused by the facts, right? Yeah. yeah. Don't let the facts confuse you. Yeah, and the last administration uh, violated, uh, put them on probation or something. <laughs> They threw him in jail, Ruben, because he made a movie exposing Obama and his corruption. Exactly. And so they got him on a, I think he, he like, uh, he, paid, he, he, he exceeded uh, the donation that you yeah. can give to somebody running for so office. So he was on probation. <laughs> they violated yeah. his probation, man. Probation violator. <laughs> yes. Wow. They, they searched his house. They, they raided his house. You know? <laughs> good. Good golly. You know, the, the issue of slavery, you know, it's historically been, it's been treated uh, with concern by the Catholic Church. Oh, yeah. Throughout most of human history, you know, slavery has, has been practiced and accepted by many cultures and, and religions around and the world. And Islam still practices it and accepts it today. <laughs> yeah. This ha happened actually in ancient Rome as well. But you remember certain passages, passages of the Old Testament sanctioned forms of temporal slavery as a means to pay the debt, pay off debt. Slaves were restored the freedom and promise promised property um, or previous property every 50 years and it was known as the year of jubilee uh, if their debt was not already paid that you know the catholic church still celebrates the jubilee year and the new testament also taught that slaves had to obey their masters you know it was an appeal to christian slaves to honor their masters and accept their sufferings in christ for christ's sake in imitation of him and um the book of philemon yep in proclaiming baptism for all, the church recognized that all men were unfundamentally equal. You know, in fact, one of our early popes, Jess, was a, was a slave. Pope Callistus the first, Callistus the first from two, 2018, 2000, uh, 218 to 222 A.D. was a former slave, and then uh, slavery slowly d decreased with multiple abolition movements in the late fifth century. So it, it goes way back, and and Scripture talks about it, and. Yeah, it, it was an institution that, as a result of men's fallen nature, it, it, that's kind of like the Darwinian ethic, might makes right. But the, again, the book of Philemon, it was that book and Jesus' teachings on the golden rule that this was, this was used by Western civilization Christians, Christianity, to abolish slavery based on the principles of Philemon and the principles of Jesus Christ to treat somebody as you want to be treated. So it was Christian ethic that chiseled away in this man-made institution, uh, you know, that was governed by one's concupiscence. And just to show you how historically, how the church has opposed uh, slavery, uh, the first person that ever spoke against owning human fellow slaves, you know, human beings, right. was St. Patrick. Back in the fourth century in Ireland, under his leadership, he told the Irish, uh, you as Catholics, Catholics cannot own slaves. He condemned slavery back in the 4th century. So that was way back then. And again, he was informed by the New Testament, the Golden Rule. And then you can go into some more contemporary uh, times. Pope Paul III, in 1537, he issued a royal proclamation known as the, the New Laws of the Indies, which forbade the slavery of Indians in 1537, papal proclamation. You got Pope Innocent XI in 1676. 
he proclaimed to Catholics that it is not permitted to buy and sell black slaves. Uh, and he said Catholics were not to engage in this activity. He said this 200 years before the Emancipation Proclamation. And, uh, and, and the fact is, Ruben, it was really Catholic thought based on the golden rule, based on what the teachings of Jesus Christ, based on the book of Philemon, the way a master is supposed to treat their slave, treat him as a brother. Right. He's your brother. It was the New Testament ethic given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ that little by little was used by Abraham Lincoln and others to eradicate the wicked man-made institution of slavery. The official catechism of the Catholic Church published in 1994 says the seventh commandment forbids acts or enterprises that lead to the enslavement of human beings to their being bought, sold, and exchanged like merchandise in disregard for the personal dignity. It is a sin against the dignity of persons and their fundamental rights to reduce them by violence to their productive value or to a source of profit. St. Paul directed a Christian master to treat his Christian slave no longer as a slave, like you said, but more than a slave as a beloved brother, mm -hmm. both in the flesh and in the Lord. So... Anyway, we uh, we point good out. stuff, Ruben. I think I think we uh, just kind of set the record straight. I think we said a lot of things that uh, were probably uh, you're not going to hear a lot of this stuff. You, in fact, this was totally this show was completely politically incorrect. So if you like what you hear, yeah. <laughs> then like us, uh, hit the subscribe button so you know when we come on Jesus nine one one and and the show's called Jesus nine one one because we turn to Jesus for help for. You know, Lord, come to our assistance. Come, Lord Jesus. He's the one that we go to for our help. That's why the show's called Jesus 911. And then there's kind of a secondary, the fact that we're all a bunch of retired cops. But uh, yeah, and, and share the show with other people, especially I think the information that we gave on slavery, I think is going to be rev a revelation to most Americans that have never heard this, Ruben. Absolutely, Jess. So uh, we're in the fight, Jesse. We got to, we got to stay armed, equip ourselves, put on the full armor of God. You know, uh, get to mass, get the sacraments, and um, and yes, amen. you know, make your voice heard, and um, double up on your rosaries, man. We we've got to we got morning morning and evening if, if possible, and uh, start reading scripture. If you're not reading scripture, you know, um, and it's you, that's going to arm you. It's get, that's right. God read scripture daily. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, let me mention why it's important for us to read scripture. I mean, it's God's word, and God's word is described as a weapon. So scripture has an offensive nature to it. It's called the sword of the spirit. That's what all Catholic prayer comes from, the, the word of God, implicitly or explicitly. And it's a weapon. And the fact of the matter is, uh, here's an imager for men. Think about this. In the movie 300, when you saw the Persians shoot thousands of arrows into the air uh, to the 300 Spartans, that's what prayer is. You're projecting your prayer into the air, and it's a weapon. Think about... 10,000 arrows raining upon the enemy. Ruben, wrap right. it up. You've been listening to Jesus 911. We've been happy to be here for you, with you. And uh, we're, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's share the faith, live the faith, and love the faith. You're going to be uh, listening to Gary Mishuda on Hands On Apologetics coming up right after this. Love you. Keep the faith. We're out. 10 7. Out. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests. O my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole Church, grant it love and the light of thy Spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great High Priest, May the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us. <laughs>